Ladies and gentlemen, happy Friday. I hope that everybody had a safe, healthy, productive work week. Uh, I'm Tom Marshall, editor of Off Grid Magazine, and we are currently on Off Grid Back Brief. This is our chance to reach out directly to you guys in the audience and discuss various preparedness, survival, and security related topics. Uh, not only just from the Off Grid staff itself, but from our contributors, no, our subject matter experts, uh, and then also to hear directly from you guys and, and hopefully answer your thoughts, questions, concerns. Uh, on the given topic. This week, if you can't tell from my wardrobe, we will be discussing chest rigs and plate carriers. Uh, with us today, we have Ed Calderon of Ed's Manifesto. We have Aaron Cowan of Sage Dynamics, Dan Brokos of Lead Fawcett Tactical, and Gabriel Bryant of Blue Green Alliance. Uh, all of these gentlemen have worked in the military and law enforcement sectors. They've all worn kit uh, all day, every day for a significant period of their adult lives. Uh, up to and including myself and my co-host, Dave Merrill from Recoil. So what we're going to do, uh, a couple of ground rules, just so you guys know, if you are registered through Zoom and you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should be able to see uh, two windows. One says chat and one says Q&A. Uh, you can ask your questions or make your comments in either one of those. Uh, Dave will be monitoring them the entire time while I'm having my discussion with the panelists. Uh, and then once we get through some, uh, some preset questions that I've got for the guys here, uh, we're going to start taking your questions and uh, we'll go forward from there. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to start the conversation with a little historical background uh, from each of our panelists. Uh, let's go around the room and say, what was your first experience wearing kit full time? Uh, talk about what it was, what job you were in, uh, how miserable it was, how terrible or good the kit was. Just, uh, just give us some initial thoughts on, uh, on the first time somebody handed you a piece of nylon and told you to strap it on. Dan, you want to kick us off with that? Oh, I will. I would say this is kind of a, I got two parts of this question. I would say in the mid nineties, um, when the whole Bosnia and Kosovo was, was kicking off, it was really, didn't have a body armor system. Um, we had sort of a flak jacket and we ordered a bunch of Black Hawk vests and threw it on top of them to hold magazines and, and all that in there. Um, but that probably progressed about a year and a half later, in the late 90s, we actually got our first really issued in. And if you research Wikipedia, it was called RBA, Ranger Body Armor. I'm, I'm not sure who, what made it, but at the time it was, it was, we thought it was the cat's meow compared to a flak vest and a old Black Hawk vest draped on over it. Um, it, it was pretty good, but it didn't have any sort of molly loops or attachments going on to it. Um, so we sort of ended up a lot of morphing, going down to the rigger shed and, and cutting up a bunch of M4 pouches, pistol pouches, putting Velcro on them and putting a big piece of Velcro on the front of it because there was really no molly at the time going on. Um, so we sort of, through trial and error, morphed into running a lot of Velcro. And that's in the, the early 90s when the old black and, and Velcro was very popular before any type of molly weave or any type of holes were cut in body armor. It was, it was all Velcro. Aaron, how about you? Uh, hmm, let's see. 1999 is when I joined the Army. Uh, then still it was peacetime military. Well, semi-peacetime, uh, pre-9-11. Uh, flak vests were given out when we needed them for ranges that were doing demo or when we were doing trench clearings and stuff. They're still teaching that. Um, and then, you know, the H harness was still a thing. And then the original IBA interceptor system is what we got after that. Uh, I left the military in 2006. We we're still using some variation of the interceptor system then, and then went into you know private contract and we used whatever we wanted. Uh, so if you had the money, you could buy what was Gucci stuff at the time. I had some coworkers that bought Dragon Skin uh, erroneously uh, right around <laughs> 2005, 2007, that time frame. Um, and then uh, I worked uniform police officer, so I wore a lot of soft armor. Uh, and then SWAT was back to you know level four plate carriers. I mean, the first first real uh, dedicated armor I had was the original sappy plates, the non-curved ones, which were kind of like, if you've never had 
to wear one. Um, if you ever get the opportunity, just pass it up. Just don't, it's not worth it. You don't, you don't need to know. Uh, the armor that exists now is so much better. Um, but if you want to get a feel for it, you could just, I don't know, throw on some AR 500. That's probably similar to, to what it would be like. Uh, and then, you know, law enforcement <clears throat> also did a lot of concealment body armor, you know, so you wanted as much protection as possible while doing something plain clothes, surveillance, undercover, something re related to that. So, I mean, I'm kind of boring with the way that I set my kit up, which I know we're going to get into. Um, but I've, I've worn a bunch of different types of armor. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to add something uh, useful to the conversation. Ed, I'm sure that you're uh, you're probably going to buck the general trend in this conversation, but uh, I definitely want to know what your experience was with Kit, uh, you know, a little further down south. Um, the, the stuff we got was second chance body soft armor. You know, uh, when we uh, first graduated, it was probably second or third hand soft body armor. And uh, as they were mentioning those sappy plates, uh, most of the stuff we got were probably surplus uh, plates. So I remember wearing those uh, crosses, that's what we would call them, you know, it was cross the bear, that weight on them. Uh, it was miserable. Uh, there was no learning curve. Basically, they just throw, uh, just threw these uh, Vesta on our feet and said, you know, there you go. You know, let's, uh, let's, go out, let's go out to work. Immediately, you realize that you have to modify everything. So the first uh, tactical vest modifier in my unit was my mom. You know, she modified most of our vest. Uh, Specifically, she uh, uh, she would uh, modify some of the uh, some of the sizes on these because uh, there's a few husky guys and a few skinny guys, and there was a single size for everybody. So uh, she did a pretty good job modifying everything. Uh, probably spent a year wearing some of those sappy plate uh, uh, plates until uh, until we found a house somewhere with some uh, better plates in there that were then uh, distributed amongst us. Uh, uh, probably American source. Uh, yeah, but it was, it was a learning curve. Uh, no, uh, we didn't have Amazon. We didn't have a tactical company uh, uh, servicing our needs. All we had was what was given to us. And usually it was pretty shitty gear. It was probably outdated by probably a decade. Uh, yeah, pretty miserable. Uh, and on top of that, we had most of our jobs involved uh, gas mask and CS gas. So it was a shit. It was, it was a, it was a pretty bad, pretty bad time <laughs> all right gabriel uh you're up i know that you're uh you're still doing the full-time gig but uh we'll, we'll get to what you're running right now in a second you want to tell us where you started off yeah so i think initially so the way the ring corps works you have that individual issue facility was the gen one or gen two when i first got in back in 2013 um, and they've already said a lot of it. It probably has progressed a little bit past the late 90s, um, but still a lot of nylon, <clears throat> very stiff, very non-modular. It was just, hey, put this on, make it work. Uh, Recon has also issued uh, additional plate carriers once they get to their battalions as well, which was a little different. Um, I wouldn't say much better, however, though, since that was the current trend of, hey, you need lots of nylon, lots of molly, this is all going to be utilized somehow or some way. So nothing crazy. MTVs, the Gen 2 plate carriers for the Marine Corps, uh, big, bulky, uh, not very effective, but they did what they did. Awesome. Uh, so kind of sticking with the same theme, what would you guys say as individual end users, what was your biggest lesson uh, from those early days of, of having to use that, you know, what is now old, outdated, secondhand, non-modular, stiff type of stuff? I, I would say it's great to see the evolution of kit. The biggest lesson learned we took away was, man, uh, the first RBA was good stuff. We thought it was great, but that shoulder pad went from your neck to the outside of your shoulders and you had no shoulder pocket um, to maneuver carbines or anything in. And I can remember guys would come off with, skateboard tape and making these little pieces for your butt stock and, and then and in the end what we ended up doing was the sappy plate in itself originally was wasn't cut the way they're cut now and it was just a big long x but we would take a 100 mile an hour tape and just roll it on the shoulders and they would tuck tuck in nice and tight right there and that would give us a shoulder pocket but we're getting rid of 
all that soft body armor up into that shoulder piece. So, uh, you know, the biggest lesson learned was go back and see that. It's like, we thought it was great, but there's a difference between mobility and survivability. Uh, and you, you have to figure out what that line is. I mean, we could throw all kinds of shit on and hunker down and we did initially, but then it came down to survivability and, and shooting strong and support side and moving fast and climbing buildings. And you, you, you got to be able to do your job and, and still survive. I remember uh, when I went to Iraq in, in 09, we were using the IOTVs, you know, and I remember having front plate, back plate, two side plates, full wraparound soft armor, the daps, the collar piece and all that. And, and it's just uh, when I wound up leaving that and going on to contracting, I, you know, kind of learned some of those same lessons. Uh, Aaron, I know you did some contract work as well. I'm sure you saw a lot of guys running a lot of uh, individualized kits. So what would you say some of the lessons were? Uh, the first lesson I learned in the military actually was uh, I was third ID, but we, we were close to Hunter. So we interacted with Rangers, which had, you know, better kit than us because I was just line infantry. And these guys are, you know, they got the PVS 15s and they get the fast robot helicopters and do all kinds of cool stuff like that. And I would just look for the dude who looked the most comfortable and I'd just check his kit out and be like, okay, what do you got going on? How you got this set up? What's this thing here? Is that tape? Is that Velcro? Like what's going on? Uh, and just try to just basically, you know, take, spots you know lesson learned of, of how he's setting up his kit and then try to emulate it as much as possible of course the restrictions we had in line units where we we weren't cool guys so individualism was shunned upon uh, so if your kit even even if it was purpose-driven modification um, if it looked too much different from the guy standing next to you in your squad you're probably going to get dinged on it uh, and then it was just amazing to me trans, you know, progressing when I started doing a lot of in vehicle work, the first time I sat down and almost got choked out by my body arm. Uh, Cause I'd never spent a lot of time sitting when I was in, you know, line unit infantry. So <clears throat> having to come up with modifications and think about the ways to approach different plates. When I was finally able to buy my own body armor as a contractor, I spent the extra money to get the thinner plates, get the triple curve plates, get the swimmer cut so I could get, you know, cheek weld on my rifle and I wouldn't choke myself out getting in and out of cramped armored vehicles or sitting in traditional bucket seats inside like a sedan or something like that. Uh, but finding a guy who, who's got his kit squared away, not only that, but also has used his kit. Like I'm not going to say he has to be super high speed, but like literally someone who's worn it on the job five days a week, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. He can tell you these just little things that are going to make your life a whole lot easier. Ed, I know you already touched a little bit on, uh, on modifying kits. So, uh, Definitely want to know what your thoughts are on this too. Uh, being able to take it off and on really fast if you have to, especially having somebody being able to take it off if you're injured or shot. I got to deal with a lot of uh, first aid stuff on some of my guys that were shot. And uh, some of those wraparound full body armors are amazing. They provide a lot of protection until they don't. And uh, so some of these uh, quick release uh, type uh, contraptions, some of these newer uh, plate armor systems have are definitely kind of a, uh, Know, valuable and they're valuable if you ever if you've ever had to take some of that stuff off really quickly on somebody or on yourself that's a pretty valuable thing um another thing that uh I learned uh, uh and it, it's one of those uh processes that you learn on, on just by experience uh individualization especially specifically when you're working with a really tight-knit group of people doing you know doing stuff out there um individualization is pretty it's pretty good uh but it uh you know, knowing where everybody's kit is at specifically when you're working out there, you know, everybody wanted to carry around their own medical gear in a different way in a different uh, part of their armor. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty hard thing to find in the dark out there uh, when everybody's carrying it where, wherever they want, you know. So one thing we kind of quickly found out was uh, you want to be slick on the front, as slick as you can. Uh, we do a lot of in vehicle, uh, we fly around a lot in small planes. Uh, helicopters. Uh, uh, if you've never had to drag yourself under a vehicle uh, in, in, in plate armor, uh, you, you probably don't know some of these lessons, but uh, the thicker you are in the front, that's going to provide some trouble with you as far as mobility and, and being able to take cover, right? So we got slicker in the front. A lot of our kit uh, uh, kind of went down to our waistline and, uh, and we, we developed a ways of getting the kit off really quickly and we we all kind of uniformed our, 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 you know, where we kept things, you know, um, trying to find things in the dark when, when they're really needed is, you know, one of those things that you don't learn until you experience it. 
Gabriel, I'm uh, curious to know uh, what some of the lessons you got from your initial issue kit uh, versus what you're running now, and if what you're running now has answered any of those uh, questions or concerns you had in the early days. Yeah, don't use any of it. Anything that was issued originally, just don't use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I concur with that. <laughs> I, everyone's got a lot of great points for it. Um, Dan talking about how to modify things for that better um <clears throat> butt stock in the shoulder there's actually a guy right now i know over at first recon that's taking the issued plate carrier because of the uniformity that aaron's talking about and he's taking the nylon and just stitching it under so when these guys leave the unit they can just rip out that stitching nothing's been altered in their kit and they can turn it back in with no problem now so finding those workarounds like that i think uh one of the big things is that that comfort and balance. So survivability versus uh, comfort is you're wearing this all day long. You can't have, you know, a fucking crowbar on your back. I apologize. You can't have a crowbar on your back and a bunch of stuff on your front, but for whatever reason, there's more weight on your back for 10, 12 hours a day. And then at the end of the week, you're like, man, I am just wrecked and do that day in and day out. So it's understanding, okay, I need to have the balance in my kit on my body so that I stay like, as a productive warfighter, because as soon as you pull a muscle or you're just too tired to react to something that is going on, then you're, you're becoming more of a liability at that point. And I think Ed brings up a huge point that the Marine Corps is actually kind of good about for this is having the uniformity of certain items. So tourniquets, knowing where everyone's tourniquet is, and it's going to be the exact same spot or your IFAC, like everyone's IFAC is exactly in the spot. So, hey, it is night, you are blacked out. Someone goes down, okay, I know it's on his right side and I can get to that. I don't have to like guess that. So everyone has that, you know, the individual operator, what they need to put like on their kit and where they want to put it. But these specific items, they're going to go here. So everyone knows where they are at all times. I, I think there's, if you're working in a, in a team environment like that, I'm sure that there's a a balance there, right, between individuality and, and also, like you said, being able to locate what you need when you need it, uh, you, whether it's for you or a teammate. Uh, so we're going to kind of bounce forward. We've been talking about, you know, what we started out with. Um, let's go around. What are you guys running now? Uh, you know, whether you're still active duty or if you're out there doing training and you're running full kit and training classes, um, what do you guys have now? Uh, or what do you keep in the closet for, you know, when it hits the fan? Uh, I'm actually still using the same plate carrier I was using when I left full-time law enforcement. Uh, I got a patrol incident gear, the SKD pig. Actually, it's about eight years old, but uh, I replaced the Velcro on it once. It's still good to go. Every now and then I get a little envious of this new kit that comes out, but there's nothing wrong with my pig. Uh, it carries whatever plates I happen to put in it. Um, it's OD green, so it's good to go there. Uh, I'm running uh, G-Code Scorpions, which um, I ran uh, H actually ran HSGI tacos on it for a while uh years ago when they first came out and they were great and then i noticed that the elasticity would start to wane and those things were snag hazards and actually i uh, saw one cause a significant almost a significantly emotional uh negligent discharge with a fellow officer because of the uh, the little bungees that hang off of them now if you secure them properly it's no big deal but he didn't know that so uh, switched over to G-Code Scorpion's been using those for a few years. That's really the only change. Uh, on my kit itself, I run two mag pouches, an admin pouch, and then it's got an internal, like almost like a kangaroo pocket for papers, flashlights, batteries, you know, zip ties, whatever else I want to put in there. And then everything else is pretty much on my belt. Uh, and I'd run side plates, uh, environment depending. And then for my, my soft, my slick carrier uh, under uniform carrier was just a level 3A with a, uh, with my backup gun. And I would secure it with um, a shirt stay so the armor wouldn't ride up and hit me in the throat. Dan, how about you? You know, Tom, my setup hasn't changed over the years. Um, yes, I was issued a certain amount of kit and plates um, in the soft community, but since I retired, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, so lighter is better. Um, I'm, I'm, I, always run velocity stuff um their scarab is super light it's it's literally like 1.5 pounds without any plates in it but i i think nowadays these kit companies it's a materials race between having you know when 
when Body Armor first started off, that RBA was 1,200 weight Cordura. There's companies making 330, 500. Now you got that trigo tri glide material that is, you can cut holes in it. Now you don't, now you don't need any molly weave on it um, as far as the material putting on the outside and you can just weave it through the holes in the thing. Um, so I think lighter is better. Lighter is better. Always, always be on the lookout um, for that. You take my initial 1200 weight Cordura without any plates or equipment on it, that thing was almost six pounds. And now you have companies that make just the plate carrier because the material is what matters. And as long as it's durable, you know, we're, we're down to 1.52 pounds. That's, that's huge. That's huge. That's three or four extra mags that you won't feel the weight out of. Ed, I know you're probably not wearing a, a ton of kit these days, thankfully, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you probably got something in the background there. Yeah, that's about it. Look at that. Uh, yeah, so I actually have, I used to, I, before I left, uh, went to Coronado, and there's a store in Coronado uh, called uh, TV Tactical. Uh, I bought a uh, Geronimo, uh, Geronimo 2 plate carrier from them. And uh, that's what I've been running. All black. Apparently, black is cheaper now. Uh, that's great, but nobody wants black anymore. That's all yeah, we that, wore down. The color black faded out in 1999, bro. Well, uh, not in Mexico. All, all the cartels wear black. <laughs> all of the uh, all of us would wear black, and it, it was one of those things where uh, during during some time we did switch to coyote uh, coyote tan. Uh, just because of the some of the cool shit that was available in that uh, regards, uh, but everybody would make us immediately just because of the color. So we all went back to black. You know, there's there's some there's some things to be said about black kit. You know, one, it looks cool. You look like a ninja. Uh, two, you can hide it in the floorboards of a car easier when you're you know <laughs> moving around. Uh, and uh, and it's cheap. You know, so T uh, three uh, tactical uh, Geronimo two play carrier is what I still have. It's about eight years old, you know, I still run it, uh, has a quick release system on it that fits all the plates I use. And that other one, that slick one, I have no idea who made it. It's one of those things that, you, that uh, gets inherited to you. It doesn't have a label on it, like most of the weird shit that we would get. Uh, but it's uh, basically Velcro front, Velcro back. Most of my stuff, shotgun, shotgun uh, rig shells, uh, sub, gun, uh, uh, sub gun and pistol, Everything has some Velcro on it, so it's a mod modular thing, easy to pack, and you can actually pack it inside of a inside of a backpack and kind of turn it into a into a shield. If that's a, that's what you're aiming for. Uh, and mo again, most of the stuff, and like I think most of the world has moved to kind of migrating some of those things into your waistline. Uh, weight matters. Weight matters a lot. And uh, I'm 38. And uh, hip, hip issues, back issues, knee issues, all that thing's going to get worse. To, uh, you know, so, you know, really think about what you're going to put on you. Gabriel, go ahead. I know you just went through yours on to, to join me here. Uh, what, what do you got running right now? Yep. So this is uh, an Arbor Arms kit. It's a cast kit. So this is a prior recon scout sniper that started this company up um, and actually – We've had these myself and like eight or nine from my last platoon bought these. And I know a couple of guys went forward and taken them to Iraq and like a couple of times. So they've had them now and they, they hold up great. Um, zero issues whatsoever. Talked about, Hey, weight's a great thing. Uh, even like talking about like mounting that buttstock, he took that into consideration, putting like a, a stickier material on there uh, and it's light as well. I think it's under two pounds. And then he actually, <clears throat> Gave me his new one though, which apparently is even lighter. And I have the the buckles on these. I uh, went to some first year type material, but it's great. Um, I can route wires through this through the actual uh, plate carrier I want, so I not have a bunch of wires dangling on the outside of me. So if I'm running antennas on my back, I can route them to my radio on my front. Um, it's a little slicker now than when we were in the teams when we were uh, forward deployed um, as an instructor. So I just I'm pretty minimal now, but it's something that I can wear all day with zero issues on or off. doesn't matter to me. Awesome. Dave, I know you've got a kit somewhere back there. What are you, what are you keeping in the back of the closet, man? Uh, 
Here we go. Uh, I've got a tear carrier here. You can tell I've got some simunition shame all over it. Uh, I usually use a tear or a first spear, and I also like the Tack Taylor Fight Light series are cool. But as I was going through my gear, I found an old school HSGI from the beginning that had 12 magazine carrier on it. You could hold it inside because that was the requirement. And that was the initial, <clears throat> my first gear modification was literally going to Gene's driveway and talking to him about it. And when he had to like before, and he was working in the back of a shoe shop. But a lot of it, a lot has changed over the years, especially just the amount of crap that we used to carry because it's not OAF2 anymore. No doubt. I uh, I do not have my original IOTV. I've got what I wore as a contractor, which is, uh, this is also a tier. Uh, it's just their basic plate carrier uh, with, you know, three mags in the, in the kangaroo pouch, a couple, one or two more on there and some other stuff. Um, what I'm wearing right now, which I put on specifically to address a point we're going to come up to here in a couple of minutes is, uh, this is actually a two layer. It's a, a first spear slick uh, plate carrier, which by itself is just like a, like a stretchy tweave type material that if I take the plates out of this, I can ball it up and it stuff it in a cargo pocket, which kind of goes to some of the stuff Dan was talking about earlier about lightweight materials. And then the chest rig is red wire gear. Um, and this is super basic. It's two mags, a TQ. Uh, I got a, a multi-tool on this side and then a, a dump pouch on the bottom that's just got some miscellaneous stuff in it. Um, and and we'll, I want to address kind of stacking a chest rig on a, on a standalone plate carrier here in a couple of minutes. But uh, before we get to that, uh, since we're all talking about brands and, and specific items, uh, what qualities are most important to you guys uh, when you're shopping for new kit, whether it's color, price point, uh, weight, which we've already talked about, uh, feature sets, things like that. What do you guys look for when you are in the market for kit? For me, the first thing is, is does it create a snag hazard? And I'm pretty paranoid about that. And also, how is it going to behave when it gets wet? Is it going to add, you know, three, four, five pounds of weight to me because it, it just absorbs liquid? Uh, price, relatively speaking, has never been a serious issue. I mean, I've taken a bath a couple times. Like, not too long ago, I bought the, um, <clears throat> just out of curiosity, I bought the SNS plate frame, which is pretty pricey for a plate carrier for what you get. It's good kit, but I'm not a I'm not a big fan of reloading the rifle primarily off of the chest rig. Um, I'm a cross lateral shooter, uh, so that means rifle right handed, pistol left handed. Some people are the reverse, so my primary reload on the AR always comes from my belt. So for me, the magazines that are mounted on the chest aren't that big of a priority. This thing comes standard for three magazines on the chest, and then you don't really can't put really anything else on it. So it's basically just a plate carrier with three mags on it super lightweight it's not going to collect moisture it's not going to collect water because the material it's made out of but it didn't do what i needed it to do uh, so that was just one of those kind of expensive mistakes as far as plates go i'll spend any amount of money if i get the right threat rating and i lose weight makes sense dan how about you what are you looking for um, you know, you get what you pay for. I, I, I would say that I, I would say, Hey, for anybody out there that is shop around. Um, I, I think you should take a look at weight is weight is huge. Um, what the material is made out of, of, of course. Uh, but at the end, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a, a, it's a fight for, Hey, what's next in material. Cause it's always going to improve. Um, and lighter is better. Makes sense. Gabriel, uh, you, uh, you already talked about some of the stuff you like in the, in the rig you're wearing right now. Uh, but again, just as general guidelines, uh, I'm sure there's some people out there who are considering uh, or have probably recently made uh, a first kit purchase. So, you know, what are you, what are you looking for if you're starting from zero? <clears throat> so, for, for us, one of the necessities as a maritime asset in the reconnaissance community is a maritime disconnect. So something that we fall in the water, hey, I can pop this off. You can ask anyone that knows me, I'm not that much of a swimmer. Um, I'm gonna try to get everything off me as fast as possible because I don't float. But so for, for us, that's always been a thing. So being a prior 21, John took that into consideration and put that on this as well. Everyone else already said, wait, that's a huge thing. Is this thing gonna absorb water? 
Is it going to then weigh me down? Is it going to be a snack hazard after that? Um, and then really being able to look as we're shopping for is like, what, what have they thought about? What have they considered? And hopefully uh, thinking about the consumer, any person that's going to put this online to try and sell, they're going to say, Hey, this is what this can do. And then this is why, because a lot of new time kit buyers aren't going to be thinking of everything down the road. They're not going to have the experiences that Ed has had, you know, five years prior. So someone that can put that on the website and say, Hey, like, this is why this is the setup for this. And as a consumer, I can be like, okay, cool. I didn't even think about that, but now I have that capability. So I think those are some of the big things that buying new kit, hopefully you can go on those websites and check it out and say, okay, like it does this, 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 and this, I now have this to consider. And I have this ability to set this up this, this, this way. Ed, you're used to secondhand hand-me-down stuff as it is already. Uh, what, what do you got from that that you wish that you could have had a chance to consider uh, if you were you know, making a purchase or starting from zero or selecting kit? I, I think uh, there's a lot of places to cut corners, you know, but uh, plate armor is not one of them. Uh, I think a good investment in plates that are light quality and then have a, the right uh, uh, threat rating on them, that's great. Uh, that's not a place where I would, that was kind of like, a, that's not a place where I would want to save money. Another thing is realistically, uh, a lot of people buy armor because that's what the cool guys are wearing or that's because they saw it on Call of Duty or some, some weird shit like that. Uh, be, be honest and be realistic of, uh, about what you're going to use that armor for. If it's, uh, if it's something you're going to keep in your house for a grid down type scenario, you know, you're going to have to hide it underneath your clothing. You're not going to be walking around uh, out there uh, in full kit in some places. You know, I travel around a lot, so the realities change depending on where, where I am. Uh, so I'm not going to wear all black uh, Molly gear, uh, plate carrier somewhere down in Michoacan when I'm moving around there. I'm going to wear something underneath my clothes. Uh, so kind of be honest and re realize what you're going to use it for. One, are you going to use it to show off at the range, or are you going to use it uh, in case something really happens and you have to kind of put that on? Uh, that's one thing I really look for, and I tell people to kind of be honest about that as far as selection. Uh, mentioned uh, the quick detachment of a, of a plate carrier uh, for maritime operations. That's the ones that I that I have have that for maritime, but also for medical management stuff. If you've never had again, if you never had to cut uh, ear off people, or if you never had to deal with somebody with uh, severe burns after their car exploded for 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 some reason or car accident, that type of stuff. Uh, that's another reason why you would want something that is. Uh, that has that capability. And finally, weight. Uh, weight is an issue that is not addressed. Uh, I remember this one horrible instructor we had, uh, had all this table out with all this gear, said, put everything you need on, we're gonna do a raid, you know, mock raid on this house. So everybody put on everything, including the kitchen sink, and uh, we just, he just took us for a run, right? And uh, basically gassed all of us out. Um, uh, weight isn't an issue until it is, and uh, some people count on being able to fly there, drive there, uh, but if you're not able to walk there, uh, I think you should kind of reevaluate your, your physical capabilities and what you're actually going to carry. So, again, weight is one of those things. Dave, I know you and I kind of, we were, we get the chance to play with a, a lot of kind of new and shiny stuff. Uh, you know, what do you see in terms of from the industry side that uh, either is a trend that people are, are moving towards or uh, that you personally think are, are kind of, you know, important qualities to go after? I think the lightweight, like people have been saying, uh, look, when I was 22 years old, you know, I'd carry a million magazines. And what does it matter if it's multi layers of a 1000D Cordura on you? Because, you know, I was a dumb kid. And as I get older and then you have you're not carrying as much as many magazines anymore. And it's we're really, it's one of the things is everything is being really streamlined. <clears throat> so that that's, that's what I, I look for weight a lot. And I look for ease of attachment too, because I might be swapping stuff around, especially if I'm evaluating a new piece of gear, I might want to run it slick. If I'm just going to do a, a shoot house with a handgun and I required, I'm required to have hard armor inside plates, or I want to be able to do that. And there's just some, some are just so much easier than others. Like I love Hypalon attachment as long as you can support it or then it'll start to sag and stuff like that. Like Dan said, it's all about materials and stuff like that. So, and, and, and what you're doing with it. So, and also QD is really important to me. I had a lot of friends drown in um, irrigation ditches 
early on. And that's, all, that's because, and that's why we have all the QD systems now. Because if you, you end up in water and you can't get your kid off, you're not coming out, not alive. So. Mission drives the gear. Uh, for those of us that are joining late, we're just going to take a quick refresh here. Uh, welcome. If you came in a little late, uh, here we are, the off-grid back brief which is our chance to live stream uh, and get a round table discussion with, with, from some SMEs around the industry, some of our contributors uh, to talk about, you know, various uh, survival, safety, security related topics. Uh, this week's uh, episode, we're going to focus on plate carriers and chest rigs. Uh, with us, we've got uh, Dan Brokos from Lead Fawcett Tactical, Aaron Cowan from Sage Dynamics, Ed Calderon from Ed's Manifesto, uh, Gabriel Bryant from Blue Green Alliance and my co-host Dave Merrill from Recoil. Uh, so we're going to keep moving. Our next question, kind of in the same vein, is uh, what are your three must-have items uh, to load up on a plate carrier or chest rig? Uh, number one, I mean, medical kind of goes without saying, but, you know, sometimes it needs to be mentioned. I think a lot of people look at medical, well, I won't say a lot. Some people look at medical last, especially people who've never had to wear a plate carrier professionally, not a ding on them. You know, they didn't go in that line of work. So, you know, the experience sometimes is something you get right after you needed it. And when it comes to medical gear, that's not the less, that's not the way you want to learn the lesson. So for me is, is take a look at your medical, not only for you, for you, but medical that you may need to aid another person. Cause if I got one tourniquet, that's, that's mine. That's for me. Um, <clears throat> but having a second tourniquet, tourniquets don't weigh a lot. They don't take up a lot of space. Uh, they can be properly staged um, in, in any number of places. My plate carrier, I've got one on the carrier inside the kangaroo, and I've got a second one on my belt. So if I've taken my plate carrier off for some reason, I've still got my, my, my purpose IFAC with another uh, TQ, chest seal, you know, everything I need in there. Um, and then kind of for me is differentiating um, priority of equipment. Uh, is there anything on your plate carrier that you can live without if you have your plate carrier off? So if you're running a plate carrier with a war belt, and you, like for me in law enforcement purposes, if we've just done like a warrant or something like that, and plate carriers are coming off, but you're still in the house doing whatever, what, need, may, what may I need still on my belt, like duty belt situation, if I don't have my hard armor on? So kind of having some pouches that serve double duty, um, a flashlight on the plate carrier comes out, goes on the duty belt when the plate carrier comes off. Uh, having extra pouches, just little, you know, mag pouches, multi-purpose for a multi-tool flashlight, any kind of tools like that, super useful. Um, I think, you know, that's pretty much it. Um, good mag pouches will save your life. A good admin will save your life. But you also don't want to have an admin pouch so big that you just start putting extraneous nonsense in it that you don't actually need. Because uh, that's just going to add weight. A lot of guys will be like, oh, this pouch has this many pockets, so I must need to fill them. Um, That'd be my advice because that definitely helps save weight a lot. And then think about environment. Are you going to be near a patrol car or are you going to be, you know, three or four clicks from a patrol base? Uh, that kind of dictates what, what kind of kit you put on, what kind of kit you don't put on, or I should say gear on your carrier. Ed, how about you? Uh, first line gear goes directly on your body. Uh, I think uh, plate care is not, uh, you know, you can lose it. Uh, if, if anybody has ever had the experience of losing a plate carrier, uh, and I have, um, the what, what belongs on that plate carrier is usually something that supports your first line gear, which is always kind of be on your waistline or on your person. Right? Uh, medical is one of those things, and usually uh, I, we, a lot of the experience I had uh, very different than some of some of the other guys here. Uh, a lot of it was uh, plain clothes, uh, where you, you would. Uh, you would be wearing a shirt, uh, a shirt, jeans, and you have to flip that uh, plate armor on. Uh, most of us carried uh, tourniquets expanded inside of our waistband, down our down our pant leg, uh, and most of the uh, medical gear was just kind of a back pocket, uh, uh, shrink wrapped uh, type of situation, right? So most of the essentials were always on us. Um, that plate carrier was made to augment the essentials that we already had on us, right? Uh, so I'd say uh, redundancy is going to be key in what you carry on that uh, plate carrier when it comes to your first line gear. So medical is pretty important. The ability to the ability to access that medical equipment, uh, be it in on your stomach or on your back, that's pretty key. Uh, it's a lesson hard to learn. Um, another thing I think is essential is fuel and light for that fuel. Uh, 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 light and fuel, you know, uh, batteries, 
Uh, if you run communication devices, that's something you know, usually would carry on my play carrier as well. Um, so batteries uh, for light and battery for communication, so juice is going to be kind of pretty important. Um, and uh, realistically, a cutting implement of some sort uh, could be a, a, a cutting a rescue hook, uh, surgical trauma shears, uh, whatever you want. Usually that was always an essential part of what we carried cutting clothes off people, cutting restraints off people, uh, cutting through things. Uh, that's one of those things that's always been on my, you know, that's always been a part of the, the gear that I carry, just this cutting implement. Uh, you know, and uh, light is very important, specifically hands-free light. Uh, usually this is something that I've learned to kind of get a love for. Some of these people run them on their helmets uh, to stream light, uh, clip light right there. You clip it onto your chest, you know, some sort of headlamp or clippable mounted light. That thing is complete money to anybody that's ever had to do things uh, that uh, they can't, they, they need to have their hands on uh, free and pointing your weapon light at something. Sometimes this is not the best, this is the best option. So I'd say a, a light source that's able to be clipped onto your gear or your head. That's, that's one of those essential items. Dan, what are your top three, and, and would you say that your would you say that your top three have changed uh, transitioning out of wearing kit full time, going to the instructor role? No, no, they haven't because um, you know when I'm running a class and it's time to put on kit, um, I, I don't want to half ass and say, "Oh, hey, I'm retired. I don't have to wear anything," um, because I, I like to wear it like I was still there. It's, I mean, it's tailored down. There's no need for me to be running around with seven magazines on the flat range because I'm going to top them off after three anyway. Um, but they, they really haven't. And I would say besides a good magazine holder, whether that's carbine or pistol, which I think you should have at least a carbine magazine. For the most part, we do wear them on our battle belt, but one up top for contingencies on your support hand side. Um, some good carbine holders so that's magazines second is always med and then i would say third would be two good gp pouches um and that is for extra batteries lights lights always for us we're always running some sort of surefire light with a a little doohickey on the end where we could slide through your your molly weave um but batteries back up are essential part of those two GP pouches and you know lickies and chewies and hey if you're extended period of time I, I, I can throw some snivel gear and something or an extra set of gloves um, so to recap that two GP pouches solid magazine pouches and some sort of med pouch all right so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about about specifically chest rigs uh, versus body armor, which uh, as I said earlier, is kind of why I'm wearing the setup that I'm wearing um, so that we can kind of address that a little bit. So this is a standalone chest rig that's got a, a secondary plate carrier uh, underneath it. So uh, do you guys uh, wear or advocate uh, standalone chest rigs for any particular scenario, um, whether it's training or general emergency preparedness use? Uh, and uh, if so, uh, you know, when? Absolutely. Um, work in patrol, you know, making the transition from just general law enforcement every day, driving around, doing whatever, you know, traffic or whatever detail you're assigned to, if you've got to respond to. And these days, it's usually going to come in as an active shooter, even if it turns out to not be. Um, having the ability to stage up, uh, even if it's being able to throw on uh, more medical gear with a couple extra mags, having something ready to go for that. <clears throat> also working like plain clothes. I had to use an MP5, uh, not super easy to conceal spare magazines for that. So even if the, the MP5 was concealed, and like at the time we were using 511 backpacks because the tennis racket bags are great if you're within a mile of a tennis court. Uh, any further away from that, people are going to be like, what the, what's, what's, what's up with this guy? He looks suspicious. He's in the ghetto with a head bag. Um, so having something you could just throw in real quick, I used a, a just simple H harness. I, honestly, I think it was tactical tailor, but I can't remember who made it and I could just throw it on over my three a, uh, and worst case scenario, I would just throw on level four plates over my uniform or over whatever I happen to be wearing that had, you know, extra magazines plus medical on it. Um, 
you know, situation is going to dictate. Uh, and in some, in some environments, you've got to be more low visibility unless something happens. And then you got to be able to, to stack up really, really fast. So if you're already wearing some kind of armor system, um, you need to have some kind of chest rig if you can help it. Uh, unless you're, you know, willing to suck it up and throw on a plate carrier overneath armor that you're already wearing. Oh, and uh, Tom, we skipped over Gabriel about the top three on uh, on his on his rig. So Gabriel, uh, so, so Gabriel, so okay, so let's hear your top three, and then let's talk about chest rigs versus uh, integrated plate carriers. I just Go for very it. tired of listening to me talk, Tom. Um, no, I, th I think they all hit at those well too. So hit medical, uh, it's something that is completely overlooked until you are already you were in that experience, and you're like, man, I wish I had 2020 hindsight. Um, the next one is, I think it's a little newer for plate rig, uh, plate carriers is the danglers. So basically it goes on that Velcro at the bottom of it. Um, this one I had made by Arbor Arms as well. So I can actually run my linear strip chargers right here. They'll attach and then I can put whatever I want in there. Batteries, lights, multi-tools, snacks. Uh, and I'd say third as well, going off of Dan, is the ability to hold and retain your mags. So... <clears throat> whether you're just jumping from a platform to the ground, so 10 feet, or you're doing a static line, or you're doing a free fall, is is there going to be a retention for my pistol or rifle mags for whenever I hit the ground and continue to move? Um, obviously, you need to do the, the a jump test. Hey, is anything clicking? Is anything falling off? You know, jog, sprint before I actually go out and execute whatever it is to make sure that doesn't happen. But I think those are the top three for me as well. And uh, chest rigs uh, on top of armor versus, you know, full-blown uh, battle rattle plate carriers. <clears throat> so I think I definitely have different experiences than some of these other individuals for that, where we'll wear something like what you're wearing right now uh, and just throw a Rhodesian over it for more of a reconnaissance type where we were running around um, doing training out in Okinawa or wherever in the um, PACOM area that we were at the time. Um, I have a few other chest rigs, so something from like Travis Haley, and then I've seen some of the spirit systems as well. And I think what they're talking about, the application for that is perfect. It's smaller, it's, it's low vis. You can put it under your jacket, under a sweatshirt if you need to, and then employ whatever setup you have for it when necessary. And I know you kind of already touched on this, uh, you, you know, you showed us a slick carrier and then, and then, you know, some, something that's got pouches already built into it. Uh, and you also talked about, you know, low vis or urban centric operations, uh, you know, maybe wearing less kit at first, but uh, you know, what are your thoughts on situations, you know, specifically where somebody might want to maybe doesn't need, you know, plates in it or doesn't need a full blown, you know, integrated setup. Yeah. Uh, we used to make our own, uh, like uh, there's a few companies now that make some pretty cool ones, but we used to make our own uh, like, uh, you know, heat bank robber rigs, uh, uh, basically, we would we would uh, cannibalize uh, uh, back brace uh, the those black uh, elastic back braces they use for low carry. Uh, would flip flip them like a taco and actually put the magazines there and uh, just just uh, make them uh, make them into the shape of a whole bandolier. So we put that on on top of uh, on top of some of the armor we'd carry underneath our t-shirts. Um, you know, sometimes you would have to level up. Uh, realistically, a lot of those times uh, when things happen at that uh, speed, uh, we put things on our waistline faster than we would put them on our chest. Uh, it was just easier to click something on your waistline. Um, uh, somebody mentioned uh, tennis rackets for MP5s. We were running uh, Spitfire backpacks, skateboarding backpacks. That's what we would run. Uh, cut the uh, zipper off and just put Velcro all around the uh, – all around the internal compartment so you can rip it open. You know, that's what we would run. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think they, have a, they have a place. Uh, if you need to go from uh, low visibility to high capability when it comes to uh, having a little bit more on your, uh, on your chest. Uh, I think, uh, but one of the things that I don't like about them is that it does, it, it, it does tend to have some, uh, some snag hazards and grab handles uh, for other people if you're into, uh, if you ever get into a situation where you actually have to work with it, uh, with a lot of people around you, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good uh, rig to train some judo with. If you know, if you, if you kind of get what I'm, what I'm saying, 
Uh, if you've never had to roll with anybody uh, with uh, some setup like that on you, you know, your life's been pretty good, you know, uh, but, you know, usually, usually, usually that, that amount of those, those amount of straps on you, those are, uh, I don't know, we, we would rather put some of that stuff on our waistline. So uh, the, I stripped the chest rig off this. So this is now, you know, just a slick plate carrier. Uh, and Dave actually brought up a really good scenario for that in terms of uh, if you're in a class environment, you're running a shoot house, you know, a lot of instructors, uh, even if you're just shooting pistols, will mandate having some kind of armor on, uh, which is, you know, where I might run a, a rig like this that doesn't have, you know, anything else on top of it. Uh, so kind of sticking with this topic, minimal, minimalist lightweight loadouts uh, can be awesome. Uh, in a bunch of situations. And then there are just some times uh, where, you know, you, you need the, the full kitchen sink uh, at easy access. Uh, I, the, so the question is, where would you guys draw the line? Uh, is, is there such a thing as too much or too little? Uh, and if so, you know, what are your, uh, what are your thresholds for that? I, absolutely. Uh, when I worked a, as a contractor, worked with this one guy, um, it was his first day out, basically his first contract. He'd been, you know, military, but I think it was his first time being able to decide what kind of kit he got versus being told. So he just went, you know, crazy with it. And he was carrying a pro it was either 10 or 12 spare magazines um, on the carrier. Uh, and I'm like, are you going to, are you going to dig in? Like literally you're going to dig yourself like a little, little hole when you have to go prone and work under a vehicle or, I mean, I'm excited to see how this goes personally. Cause uh, even in that environment, you know, working overseas uh, you, you, you kind of get into that situation where you're like, well, I want to be prepared for anything, but you, you got to weigh, you know, likelihood. Uh, and then think about, okay, what's the realism of me being X amount of feet or X amount of miles or whatever away from gear I think I need. Uh, and you kind of regulate your ammunition to that. I think the, the biggest mistakes I've seen people make is there is such things too much ammunition. And if your ammunition is going to weigh you down to the point that you can't move effectively from cover to cover, or you're going to slow down a unit then you, hopefully someone else is talking to you first and before you have to come to the realization that, that you may become a heat casualty because you decided to, to haul out 12 magazines and then you have an unexpected walk that you didn't, uh, you didn't plan on taking. Um, my biggest lesson learned was there. I wasn't nearly as bad as that guy, but I was like, oh, I'm, you know, seven magazines. That's the military top, you know, I'm taking that with me to contracting and then to law enforcement. I figured out pretty quick, like, bro, if you need seven magazines, um, what, where are you? What did you do? What mistakes were made? Let's, let's work this backwards and think about what, what mistakes you've made in your life to end up in this situation. So I, I kind of, I still think like worst case scenario, but tempered by not only my experience, but relying on the collective knowledge of other dudes, like talking to guys who've been into way more high speed stuff than me and way more worse situations than I was ever in and asking like, you know, what was the apex of gear? What were you seeing? Uh, and kind of tempered that occasionally. So now, like, you know, I may, I have the ability to add more ammunition to my kit, but I'm running, you know, four rifle mags, four pistol mags, counting the one that's in the gun, same with the rifle. Uh, and if I really worry about it, my 30 round comes out and I throw a D60 in there. So my first magazine is two magazines. Gabe, what would you say about that? Um, I think so too. I think if you, whatever your current mission set is, um, so for us, if it's VBSS and you're, you're going through a ship, if, if I have so much on, I can't fit through a hatch or a manhole, then it's, it's too much where we've had instances where talking about, you know, four or five rifle mags and the scenario is, you know, three to five individuals on that critical vessel of interest, but you're going on with 20 people. So, you know, do, 20 times five times 30 and like that's a probably overkill at that point as well uh so tempering expectations with experience of what is necessary and then going with that as well so now i think aaron hits it on the head for some guys that just have overkill and what you're expected to do can you perform it and then adjust as necessary Dan, I know you're doing a lot of uh, open enrollment carbine classes, um, specifically for your civilian students. You know, what are you seeing as the trend? Is there a, you know, is there a propensity to want to overdo it or underdo it? 
um, you know, what does the happy medium look like to you? Um, well, everybody's in there is a little bit different. They don't over, overdo it, but I think a trend across the board and it's starting to scale back a little bit. But when I first retired, I seen a lot of organizations overdoing it, not as far as what's put on their kit, but when we talked initially is nowadays there's, there's a widget for every part of your kit. I've seen units show up with set protectors, a neck pad, a groin pad that goes down to the, your knees and a lower back plate and two side plates that are like 12 by 12. Don't even add magazines right there. Good luck on making entry. Oh, by the way, throw on your helmet, iPro, Peltors, and be at night and get in a combative situation. Um, that's the biggest thing. I, th I think that's overkill when it comes to kit. You, you don't need bicep protectors. You don't need a neck guard. You need a good ballistic plate, a good plate carrier, have some common sense. I, I'm all for the, the groin protectors, um, a back plate, um, side plates are all, all cool, but you, you see most of the kit companies, you can get the full gamut. You can get the whole RoboCop effect if you want on that thing. Um, and that's the biggest probably thing I've seen out there is, all right, guys, put on your kit. And I'm like, holy shit, how the hell are you going to transition that weapon from your strongest support side? You can't. You can't do it. They got so much stuff. Um, but, you know, some of these agencies, by law, that's not, but not by law, but by their chief, that's what they got to wear. Ed, I know you talked a lot about scaling up and scaling down based on the mission. Um, for somebody looking kind of for a general purpose, uh, again, what do you, what does middle of the road look like for you? Uh, I mean, if, uh, I, I usually go by the mantra that, you know, you train like you fight and you fight like you train. So if I, if I can't, if I can't hold that weight on me, uh, during a jog or a run, uh, if I can't actually perform in that, uh, with that weight on myself, I'm probably, you need to scale back that weight. Also, another thing is girth, you know, you know, how thick are you? You know, uh, he was talking about the Robocop armor. You know, I, I, I remember we had some entry, uh, full entry vest uh, handed to us at some point and everybody put them on and they were cool as hell, but you know, no mobility, no mobility at all. Uh, you had to figure out your way how to jimmy rig them. Uh, and I remember this one time we, we went after these guys, these cartel guys, they were wearing all of the armor. I mean, all of it, you know. They were wearing side plates, front plates, uh, facial armor, helmets. They were wearing all of that stuff. It looked pretty impressive until you realize you don't have any mobility and you don't, you can't see uh, to either sides of you, right? So that was pretty. That was a pretty interesting experience, um, seeing what the what that full armor actually does. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd say this: uh, mo one of the biggest factors people miss is their physical capabilities if they're not honest about that self assessment. What the, what they can actually carry with them, you know. Uh, I think people should analyze that first. Uh, second, uh, you know, I used to work in some pretty bad places, and I ran out of ammo twice in my life. Uh, and I think I uh, used to run three magazines on my plate carrier and two on my, uh, on my sub gun, right? And that was enough for most things. And I was into some crazy stuff. Uh, you know, we have this tendency to over-prepare. You know, that's, that's fine. Uh, but scale back into what you're actually physically capable of carrying, what you're physically capable of moving with. And uh, if you need to do some improvised parkour, I mean, just realize that all that, all that stuff's going to bite you in the ass. I agree hundred percent, Ed. I agree. I like that improvised parkour. I think one more thing off of that from what he's saying, Tom, is you have these guys that wear all this equipment and all this gear. Um, you could easily take all of them to a pull-up bar and say, okay, hey, knock out three pull-ups. Like, can you do three pull-ups with this kid on right now? And you're like, okay, you're going to have a few guys. Okay, you can do it. Okay, cool. Everyone else can be like, whoa, I can't do this. It's like, so you can't even simulate right now pulling yourself up and over something, but you're going to say this is all vital equipment. Uh, or it's easy as, hey, we're going to go for an 800-meter jog. Uh, it's a good way to test your gear. Everything's going to fall out. And let's see how smoked you are at the end of that. 800 meters is a pretty good distance. But I know plenty of men and women that have moved that with themselves, their kit, with other individuals that they're having to drag. So it's very realistic as well. Um, just simple tests like that, that 
units and individuals are going to buy all this kit and use everything, but they won't ever say, okay, what's simplistic and how can I test it? All right, we're starting to start to run the clock out a little bit here. I do want to make sure we get to some audience questions. Uh, Dave, I know you've probably got a couple of those lined up for us. Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, uh, a lot of people are asking uh, what plates that each of you are running. And I'm sure that a lot of you have multiple ones. So I guess what would be your preference? Like on your go-to, what kind of armor are you using? Some people are asking about AR-500. I very much doubt that any of you guys have any AR-500. Uh, you know, M M193 being what it is. Uh, so if we can go around, I guess we'll, we'll just start with you, Aaron, and go from there. Uh, I've got some poly plates, some Defender, which is Honeywell, um, uh, level three special threat. So they'll stop that green tip. Um, it's like a hybrid plate. Uh, and then I've got some, uh, my heaviest plates are some old velocities, which are still triple curve, standalone level four, multi-hit, basically ceramics. Really good plates. They're nice and heavy though. Uh, and I've also got some much lighter, much more friendly uh, paracletes. In fact, my side plates have always been paracletes. I think that's how you say it, right? Paraclete. That sounds right. Uh, and then I've got uh, soft armor. I've got some, some safe light on the way, but I'm still using um, some old second chance. I would say old, relatively speaking. It's, it's not expired or anything, uh, but it's uh, Dyneema Kevlar level 3A standard, nice slick, high thread, impact thread count. So it's a really thin plate because um, the biggest problem with soft armor is, you know, the cheaper it is, the thicker it usually is. And that's how you end up... Uh, getting rashes in weird places, uh, choking yourself, um, and having all kinds of other interesting things. Like I can't put my hands together when I shoot because my armor is too thick. Um, that's pretty much it. Gabriel, what are, what are you guys running or what, what would you prefer to run? I'm glad you specified for the prefer versus what the Marine Corps gives us to run. Uh, <laughs> Still have some nice, bulky, ceramic-y sappies. Um, that's what's out right now. I've heard we're moving to something else as well. I hope we do. Uh, I know there's a lot of different types of plates out there. Um, American Blast Systems is some plates that I've had and a few kits that I've been able to test out as well. They're level three, super light, like 1.5 pounds each, uh, which I think is ideal. Um, and I hope it's a direction that the Marine Corps goes is saying, hey, there is better materials out there that are lighter because we've already said weight is the biggest factor in all of this. So hopefully in the near future, it's instead of five or six pounds per plate, it's, you know, one to two pounds per plate with that same strength, like the technology's there. Uh, we'll get there soon. Dan, same thing. How about what you, uh, what you used to have to run versus what you're choosing to run? Well, I wouldn't say this, you know, um, I'm not saying I had issued plates in my stuff the whole entire time. Um, but I, I, if you're going to ask me, um, I, I like ceramic plates. I, I run Velocity makes a set. They're multi-strike, 762-855, Alpha 1, even though we, we're not going to shoot each other. Um, but they're, they're multi-strike, standalone ceramic. They're half-inch thick, about 3.8 pounds total. I, I, I think ceramic's the, the wave of the future um, and, and getting away from having a conjunction of a plate and summer. There's a need for soft armor, but you shouldn't have to run them in conjunction. Ed, how about you? What kind of weird junk did you have to run versus what you want to run now? Well, we're running these uh, ADI's uh, level three ones right now, ceramic, beautiful, lightweight, you know, that's pretty good stuff. Uh, used to run steel, zappy, that, those suck. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, you know, the ability, the ability to wear one over the other, you know, uh, some of the places I travel to actually carrying around or work, uh, working and traveling around with armor in some place in Mexico, probably not the best thing in the world. Uh, people can see that. So what I would like is something a bit thinner that I can wear underneath my clothes, uh, threat levels down there. I mean, if you're not wearing something level three, realistically, what are you, what are you wearing? Right. Um, so yeah, uh, ceramic myself. Again, I'm, I agree with the whole moving into wearing a single uh, plate instead of wearing soft and, and hard. I think that's where we, we all want to get to uh, as far as a destination. That, that, that's a pretty good place to, to be. Dave, what else have we got from, uh, from the viewers? Well, 
we don't have uh, a woman on this panel, but uh, for those of you with spouses and significant others and uh, female students and whatnot, do you have any specific recommendations uh, for for armor and such for women being our being our, our body shape and physiology being a little bit different? Ooh, um, <laughs> yeah, that's we've all that's seen the one. smashers. I mean, like my ex-wife when she wore hers, it was just. Yeah, chance. I mean, my, my best, this is what, like, when I was, uh, when I was an FTO, female officers, you know, we, we would always send them to a shop and have them special fit. You know, there's no point in trying to buy them armor. Same with plate carriers. We'd send them, you know, they'd go to the shop and the, the shop was actually owned by a, a trooper's wife who had been on the job for a little while until she decided she didn't, she wanted to do something else. Uh, but she was really good about, you know, making, making things work for, for females. Cause of course, with dudes, we usually come in a couple of different sizes, but roughly the same shape. Uh, females is not necessarily that at all. Um, so having, having something, you know, fit is better than me as a man being like, oh, I'm just going to buy this female armor and it's going to work great for her. So guys, if you're buying your wife armor, do her the favor of taking her to a shop that does fittings for armor and, and getting it done that way. Gabriel, I see you leaning in there, man. Go for it. I mean, yeah, I think the only other suggestion is if you don't have a shop nearby, but you do know where courses are being held, just take your wife out there. Um, find some of the smaller dudes that are training and say, hey, can I borrow your kit um, and see if it fits her or, you know, it's a one-off and then you can get one size smaller of that. Uh, I think that's anytime you're, you're looking into something that you're not sure of, not being able to put it on your body. It's like buying clothes online. You're like, uh, I think this is going to fit me. And then you get it and you're like, man, really didn't consider the fact that this was European sizes versus American sizes. But something like that is just going somewhere where you can get the hands on to test it, to save yourself the heartache of, okay, now I need to return this or this isn't going to work. Uh, I know that, uh, I know that tier uh, is, is making a line of, of female focused. Uh, I think it's their Epic line of carry armor and plate carriers that are, are supposed to be sized and shaped uh, a little bit better. Dan, I'm wondering, are you seeing anything in the, in your, like your carbine classes or anything like that? Are you seeing female students that are running one um, brand of kit? They're, they're wearing kit and I've asked them specifically and it's just a matter of taking a small, medium, large, whatever fits, you know, compared to how, 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 what their body type is um it's just a matter of uh, getting it custom fit um but i i think you're right there's a lot of these uh a lot of companies out there will will tailor a female based on based on her curves and 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 chest size and all that so it so it fits properly now i mean right now the military's issuing stuff and there <laughs> there's no hey females getting this line males getting this line you get what works for you but that's not the right answer. It's just most of these companies are, are, are making them for females. You just got to call up and specifically ask. Ed, how about you through your channels? I, I, I don't know how many, how many females you were working alongside per se, and they probably just got issued the same stuff you guys did. But uh, if you've got um, any insight on that. Uh, being, you know, we, we did have females. Uh, some very courageous ones. So I did, I remember seeing their faces when we, you know, handed out uh, plate carriers and they were like, um, you know, what I'm going to do with this, right? It's the whole sandwiching effect they have with those things. Uh, when they strap them on, it's just, I think customization. One thing I, one thing that most of them did was basically take them to places where they could have elastic, uh, uh, elastic specifically on, on this area. And on the side area, so it had a little bit more space on on them like that. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where if if anybody wants to get anything custom, uh, probably take a little picture of where the plate armor actually has to be covering, because sometimes you see people customize those uh, plate armor setups and the plate armors all the way down here or all the way up here. You know, uh, I think customization for them if you could if you can afford it. You know. Uh, or if you can, if you find somebody, seamstresses are everywhere in Mexico. So we didn't have a lot of problems with modifying things, right? Well, I think, uh, I think that about does it for the time that we've got for this, but I, I want to thank all of you guys for, for joining us and, and everybody out there in the audience. Uh, you know, I hope that we answered some of the questions and concerns that you guys might've had coming into this. 
Uh, always feel free to reach out to us via email or social media. If, if we can answer something after the fact, we're happy to do that. Uh, but thank you guys for coming. Uh, enjoy your weekends and, and we'll talk to everyone soon.